to you about doing the work of God tonight and the example that God has given us. And uh, God is trying to raise up a people. And I don't, I don't like to, to get on big tangents and, uh, and, and maybe not make things very clear or whatever, but Sister Jan at Ghost Martin House of Worship had got up last night and mentioned... Uh, had mentioned a dream she'd had, Daddy, and she said in that dream, everything that she seen was a given birth. Everybody she seen was a having youngins. And she thought that was just such an odd dream, and I, I would concede, man, that's a pretty odd dream. I, I probably don't think that was normal, but she, it was clear to her that God was dealing with her, and God laid the interpretation of that dream on me last night, Dad. And, uh, and, and, it, and it ties directly into what God, God started dealing with me on November the 6th. And we was talking about last Sunday, which was the 7th, and this Sunday, and even what we preached on ministry on, on last night at the Martin House of Worship. Uh, it all ties directly back in. And uh, a, a spiritual birth, or a birth, if you will, in the, in the spiritual sense, in the analogy, is the birth of something new, a new ministry. Something that God's getting ready to do. Sister Tony. And the church in a roundabout way is under persecution. Can you say amen? amen. And any time that the church comes under persecution, Brother Dingus, there's only one thing that happens and it gets bigger. Now, I don't mean that I ain't, that I ain't talking about a big wide revival necessarily. That ain't what I'm driving at, but they tried to stop them out in Egypt and they went in 77 and they walked out 5 million. Uh, they tried to get rid of Jesus and what the, uh, the preaching of Jesus in the book of Acts and not only did it... Uh, uh, set Jerusalem on fire, hit run all over Asia Minor. Yeah. And they, you can't stop it when they put the pressure to it. Uh, we, the church works better under pressure. Now, what people do with that when God pours out His Spirit is up to them. Uh, but what God is getting ready to do, and that, this has been confirmed to me on several different levels, is we're getting ready to see God begin to do things inside our churches that we've not seen in a long time, Brother Dingus. Uh, the book of Joel, as Peter preached out of it, was talking about how in the last days he would pour out his spirit upon man, and the old man would dream dreams, and the young man would have visions. Is that the way that verse goes? Yes. And, uh, and we're yeah. going to see that come to pass. Now, that's not the limit that young men can't dream dreams, and old men can't have visions, or it's right. all religion. Right. It's, it's, it's an analogy of the fact that God's going to pour his spirit out, Brother Robbie, and we're going to begin to see that. We're going to begin to see that come to pass in our churches. And you say, well, how do you know? Well, the Word tells me, first of all, Secondly, he said, how can you discern uh, the, how that you're going to have good weather by the sky and how can you discern it's trying to pluck the crops by the plants, but yet you can't look around you and see what's going on. Right. And, uh, and I can look around me, Brother Scott, and I can see what's going on, Bert. And we're getting ready to see these things in our churches. We're getting ready to see things change in the world. And I'm not listening to meaning for the better, but we're going to see God pour out His Spirit upon church, on the church. Now, having said that, that's not limited to this church, by the way, Brother Blake, but... He's getting ready to pour the Spirit up out, uh, upon the church, Dad. And having said that, we've got to be active individuals. We've got to be up and about the Lord's business, Sister Lori. Now, that don't allow me to neglect my daily duties. i still got to be a husband and a daddy before I'm anything else. And he said, if I don't provide for my family, I'm worse than an infidel. And an infidel is somebody who never believed in the first place, Brother Scott. And so for me to say I believe and neglect my family, Brother Denver leaves me in a bad spot. But it does tell me that when my duties are fulfilled, the thing that I ought to be doing the most is pouring my heart out to everybody else, Brother Dingus. And he wants active people in the church. Uh, John 15, 15 reads and says this. He says, Henceforth I call you not servants. This is Jesus talking to uh, his disciples that was around him. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. Amen? Come on. I sit back in my office and I got people that work for me and they have no idea what I'm doing in my office. They, they have no idea. They think I'm back there just chilling. But there's paperwork to be done. There's phone calls I got. There's things I'm doing. Oh, Brother yeah. Robbie, they don't have got a clue about it. Right. And that ain't no derogatory statement. That's just, no. I'm just making an analogy out of that. This just is what it is. That's so right. the servant, Brother James, has no idea what the master's really doing. That's right. He said, so I don't call you servant. He said, but I have called you friends. Yeah. He just yeah. done that in the verse above that. He 14, he said, you are my friends if you do whosoever I've commanded you. Right. 
For all things that I have heard of my Father, and those last five words, six words, I have made known unto you. In other words, he said, I'm not keeping any secrets. He said, everything I know, I've let you know. Yeah, come on. And that brings us back over to, to John chapter 5, if you want to flip back over there with me. Uh, we'll be reading there in a moment. But the point of that is, is this is not some big great mystery, Dad. We're not down here without a guidebook. We're not down here without rules and regulations. We're not down here without a way to know how to serve God. Brother Dingus, that's not what he left us with, Sister Lori. He gave us what we needed right there in the book. He gave us the commandments. He said, what you see me do, I'm doing it my Father. We're going to read that verse in a minute. And he said, so I'm going to let you in on everything you need to know, not because you're my servant, but because you're my friend. And if you read on in the New Testament in Paul's writings, we're called brothers to Christ, joint heirs with Him. That means I get equal share in the cut, if you want to call it that. And you know what? So that means we're, we're on a playing field right there where we're, uh, we're knowing the information that He knows about what's coming to pass, Dad. And He give us the commandments to follow Him. And I, I'll tell you, He said, uh, he said Said, I'll give you a new commandment in one place and I thought that was a really cool thing that he done that because he never said that in the New Testament anywhere else but he said I give you a new commandment but I like it where they said what was the greatest commandment and he said well I love the Lord God, God with all thy heart and soul and mind and he said the second is like the first and he said you love your neighbor as yourself and he said all the prophets and the law hang on that amen amen, amen. So see, he's already told me what to do, Sister Lord. Now, he said there, we're going we're to read 5, 17 and then jump down to 19. But Jesus answered them, and he was talking to some religious uh, bigots at the time who thought they knew what they were doing, but they were just really wrong. But Jesus answered them, and he said, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Let me put that in modern English. He said, Dad's been working up to this point, and I'm a working too. In other words, God's working right now, Brother Dingus, and Christ is working with him. And you know what? When I become a joint heir with Christ, that means I'm supposed to be working alongside Jesus. Come on. I'm supposed to, if God is working right now, Brother Robbie, I'm supposed to be working right now. I don't have an option as a servant of Jesus Christ to sit back and hold my pew down. I don't have an option to bolt my door and shut out the world. Glory to God. If my God is working on a lost and dying world, Brother Reed, I've got it. Come on. I've got my commandment, Daddy, yeah. that I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. Hallelujah. What my Lord wants me to be doing. And He said over in 19, He said, and then Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son of Man can do nothing. What? Of Himself. But what He said the Father do, for what things soever He doeth, these yeah. also doeth the Son likewise. Yeah. He said, I don't do that on my own accord. I don't create my own big ideas. He said, I'm going to do what Daddy tells me to do. The Father's will. Might as well catch on 20 right there before I get off the pulpit and run around for a minute. For the Father loveth the Son and showeth Him what? All things yeah. that Himself doeth. Yeah. He said, God's done showing me everything that He's a doer. Yeah. And then if you go back and you read John 15, 15, He said, I'm telling you everything I already know. Yeah. Can you say amen? Yeah. So that tells me that what Jesus is doing, I need to be a doer. Yeah. <clears throat> that doeth Himself. And He will show Him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Yeah, come on. You see, Christ was our example. Christ was our example, Sister Sheila, that, that we can live right. Brother Burke, there was a gentleman that we knew down in Alabama by the name of Brother David Treadwell, and he wrote this song. And the line, what the ending line of the course was to prove unto man that they could live right. Yeah. 
That was why that he walked the earth. That it stands not just as he went to the cross as our sacrifice and our salvation, our justification, if you will, but it also stands as our judgment, Brother Dingus, to prove that a man can live it and, and, and breathe it and be what we're supposed to be, to live the standard. And Jesus just said it right there. He said, listen, I'm not doing anything that my daddy ain't telling me to do. And I'm going to go a bit further. He said, I'm not doing anything without him because by myself, I can do nothing. And he said, if you put all that together, he said, I ain't doing nothing by myself because I can't, number one. Number two, I ain't doing nothing that daddy ain't showing me how to do. And number three, I'm a telling you everything that he's a telling me. And that we've got everything we need right there. Amen. Our whole basis for serving God and being active, Daddy, can come right there. That's right. Yeah. You say, well, how? Prove it. Well, let's just talk about his life. He didn't have a house. He didn't have nowhere to lay his head. The only thing he was worried about was getting to the next person in need and showing them the love of God. Amen. And you know what else? He didn't say it in a month. All the big rich people in there. Now, well, he did a little bit, but that wasn't who was around most of the time. He wasn't around the, the big stuck up church people wearing the Rolexes and the three piece suits. And that's fine if God blessed you with that. But don't be asking me for money when you got more than you can spend. Lord, somebody ought to say it. Oh, yeah. Come on. Jesus didn't have to ask him for nothing. Glory to God. I didn't mean to get on that, but he didn't ask to, have to ask him for nothing. Hallelujah. He didn't need a ship to get him across the sea, and he didn't need a Learjet to get him to another country. He just set out on foot walking, and that's what he told the disciples to do. He said, get you a change of clothes, and get you a walking stick, and he said, you don't need to worry about nothing else, because he said, it'll be waiting on you when you get where I'm ascending you. Hallelujah. And you see, he didn't have to beg them, and he didn't have to plead for them. He just said, you know what? You bring me what you got. And my daddy will make it be enough. Hallelujah. Yeah, come on. But you know what I never find him being is I never find him being still. Yeah. I never find him doing anything other than ministering and praying to the Father. That, that was it. When he wasn't taking care of those that needed to know about God, Brother Denver, he was a taking care of worshiping the Father. Can somebody say? Yeah. Uh oh, do you hear the tie back to what we was talking about at the first service? If he wasn't in worship, then he was in ministry. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Yeah. I don't have an option, Tony. If Jesus is my example and the word said it was, if he's gonna tell me what to be doing, then I need to follow his example. And his example was, Brother Scott, that I take it to every person, Sister Kathy, outside of those walls. That's what he told me at the end of two of the Gospels. He said, go into all the land, preaching unto every living creature. Yeah. yeah. Come on. Come on. That's it. Being about the Father's business. I like it, Brother Davis. Yeah. And listen, he said, the well have no need of a physician. Yeah. I don't need to help Brother Bill when Brother Bill don't need help. Amen? He don't need a sidekick when he don't need a sidekick. Brother Denver don't need me when Brother Denver don't need me. Hallelujah. But you know what? If Brother Bill needs me, I might be preaching to myself. If Brother Bill needs me, I better be there. If Brother Denver needs me, I better be there. Can somebody say amen? But I'm going to take it a little bit farther. I'm going to take it a little bit farther, Daddy. If that person out beside the road got a flat tire... Come on. 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 Paul said, when one mourns, we all mourn. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. Come on. I, I loosely interpret that, but that's what the gist is. Yep. When my brother's in need, that's my call to duty. That's right. You say, how do I know that is? Because that's what Jesus does. That's right. He went where they needed him. And he said, well, prove that. Let's talk about that woman with the issue of blood. Come on. He had all these people around him. They, they were pushing on him from every side, trying to get to Come him. On. And his disciples had made kind of a ring about him maybe. And they were yeah. trying to fight him through the crowd. And yeah. it looked like probably a Hollywood movie star going through the streets somewhere. You all know what I'm driving at. You've seen it. 
And then people can't hardly move. And people, people the, Bible, the, the, the King James says they were thronged the body. Yep. And this one little low sick woman climbs underneath everybody else's feet and she touches the hem of his garment and immediately she was healed of her disease that she had yeah. been afflicted with for 12 years yeah. and had consumed all her money. And the Lord stops and He says, Who touched me? And Peter looked at him like a monkey staring at a math problem. And he said, What in the world are you talking about, Jesus? That's about the dumbest thing you could say. you got all these people around you and we can't keep them off. And you want to know who touched you? And he said, I felt the virtue flow out of my body. And you know why that's important, Brother Scott? Because he stopped in amongst all those people and he took care of the needs of one woman, of one person. When all was around him, he wasn't focused on the masses, Brother Burke, but he was focused on the one. I'll take a church of 20. Active passionate people Amen. for God Amen. that ain't got nothing That's right. in this world. And the Lord will move the very foundations yeah. of the planet. Yeah. Come on. You can keep your church at 3,000. Yeah. I don't care if I got all the money and the big screen, big screen right. projectors and all that. Oh, wait, we got one of them. I better be careful. I don't care what they got now. I won't let you have the worldly good. I'll be like, Listen, they can keep all that. Yeah. Because if all they want to do is show off their glass front building, Listen. I don't need them anyhow. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Do you want me to be real blunt? I love this pretty little church and I think it's beautiful. I didn't have no build with this church. I didn't insult anybody who done it. It's beautiful. But by crack, he's out of soon must have a drop ceiling Amen. that I can keep this place uh, cooled and heated cheaper yeah. and I'd rather be able to take the money that was invested in that pretty wood ceiling and feed somebody Amen. or close somebody oh, you know what oh, I'd like to be able to sit down with a drug addict daddy and spend my time counseling him over a table holding his hands and praying with him I'd love to be able to sit at 3 o'clock in the morning when he's about ready to have a break yeah. and say Sean I can't handle it and me be there and say man I'm here for you Amen. just come over let's watch some TV let's read the Bible let's yeah. sing some songs let's do something to keep your mind off of it so that you can get yourself yeah, prayed up yeah. to go on. That I had rather spend my time and my money touching individual Sister Tony than being able to build a big glass front church that everybody can gawk at when they go by. Because I'm going to tell you something. My Jesus was not one to look at. My Jesus was not a big, handsome, broad shoulder feller. Matter of fact, the book of Isaiah indicated that he wasn't very good to look at at all. But you know what? The people seen something in him yeah. that they didn't find nowhere else. Yeah. And they found the love of God. Glory to God. And he said, what you see me doing? He said, I want to see you doing because you're my friends. And you're my brothers yeah. and my sisters. And I've called you into the ministry. And what you see me doing is what daddy's telling me to do. And what I'm doing, I'm telling you to do. Amen. He sat down in that rich preacher's house. Can we call a Pharisee a preacher? Yeah. It'll work for analogy sake, so won't it, for the moment? He sat down in Simon the Pharisee's house. And it was custom at that time, Brother Denver, that if somebody come in your house, you wash their feet. I'm glad that's no longer a custom. But we'll talk about that another time. Not a foot person. But Jesus come down to sit. They invited him over for dinner. Wasn't that sweet of them rich preachers? Invited Jesus over. So he gets in the house and they're, they're doing the thing. And in walks probably what was a prostitute. I don't know that the Bible ever says, but I just know Simon, that preacher dude, didn't think there going to be a lot of them. And he said he thought in his mind, he said if he knew what kind of woman that was. Well, that just indicates, Sister Tony, she was bad enough, whatever name you want to apply to. Yeah, right. you, we could drum up all day. We could preach about what 40 different ways she could have been a sinner, but she was bad enough. And clearly Simon knew who she was. <laughs> what about that? That tells me he was paying attention to the environment. He was maybe on the gossip train or on the inside track. You can't never tell. 
He might have been yeah. guilty of that. Yeah. Might have been guilty of that. He yeah. wouldn't be the first preacher. No. And uh, no. and here in walks this woman. <laughs> Won't be the last one for sure. And in walks this woman who was substandard. Yeah. Is that right to use that word? She didn't live up to the church level. Yeah. Yeah. And she walks in there, Daddy, and she's a crying. And she's a weep. And she sits down beside of Jesus who comes up behind him and she takes this box of this really expensive perfume. Alabaster. Uh. And, 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 and I'll call it perfume, but that don't do it justice. It was a real high dollar salve. It, it was, yeah. you greased yeah. your hair up with it or whatever. And they, and they thought that was great. You know, you got to put that was the custom of the time. It was like, and see you women, you know, if you've been out shopping, you'll, you'll buy perfume and you'll pay a whole lot for it. You know, they make you a little bottle of tariff nod. Yeah, you know, if you buy them a little bottle, you pay $50. It ain't big as nothing. Yeah, it was an alabaster box full of spikenard. Spikenard. And, and that stuff was real high dollar and real valuable. And that alabaster box was real valuable. You know what? The, the, the package itself might have been more expensive than the product on the inside. And here she comes in and she breaks that thing open. And, and she, glory to God, she smears it on Jesus and starts blessing him and she gets down at his feet and she takes her big long hair and the tears coming out of her eyes and she's a crying so hard that she's got enough tears to do some good. Yeah. Come on, talk about yeah. a broken heart yeah. and, yeah. and a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Yeah, yeah that's what David said yeah. in Psalm 51. Yeah. He said, you don't want him. He said, a killed sacrifice. He said, but a sacrifice of God is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Somebody ought to say amen. And she was broken enough that the tears were rolling out, and she got down there at Jesus' feet, and she took her hair, and she began to wipe the dirt off his feet, and she began to wash them and cry because she knew she was in the presence of the Son of the Most High God. She knew that she was at the feet of the Savior Jesus Christ. She knew that she was next to the one that could save her soul. Oh, Simon. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, God. Bless him, Lord. And oh, Simon. Glory. He thought, well, if he knew what kind of woman that was, that. number one, he wouldn't let that old thing around him. And number two, he said, they could have sold that and made some money off of it. We could have fed somebody. And oh Jesus, and oh Simon didn't have to say it out loud. That's the wonderful thing when you deal with God. You don't ever have to say it out loud because He knows the very intent of your heart. Yeah, come on. Not just your thoughts, Daddy. He knows the intent of your heart, brother. Yeah, come on. Come on. <laughs> and oh Jesus said that Jesus knew His thoughts. Yeah. Knew what He was a thinking, Sister Kathy. And he looked over, and Brother Mark Knight brought this out. The other day, we was down there at the Cam's on the 6th. He opened up this devotional. I didn't even think about that being in there until just now. You read what it said. And see, if I'm talking to you, it's a sign of respect that I look at you, right? Yeah. yeah. Right, because I'm showing you my attention. Yeah. You read what it says. It says, Jesus looked at her and said, Simon... He didn't even turn his head. He didn't even regard. You know what? He put his attention on her. Come on, he put his attention on the one person. On the one person, not who was acting like they knew it or was better than everybody, but he put his attention on the one person who had set themselves down like the king of Nineveh in sackcloth and ashes. He had put his attention on the one person who was broken, on the one person that knew they needed help from God, Sister Millie. He put his attention on the one person in the room that's heart was bared before him and said, Jesus, I need you. And he looked at her and he said to Simon, why are you thinking that way? Come on, you think about that for a minute. He said, I've been in your house, thank you. 
He said, I've been in your house. He said, you ain't fed me. And ain't offered me nothing to drink. And he said, you ain't washed my feet. And you're supposed to be the good guy. He said, but here she comes. And she gives me the best. It's in his words now. I'm paraphrasing now. Taking a little liberty with it. But he said, here she comes. And she washes my feet, not with water, but her tears. With her broken heart. And she gives me the best thing she can. Amen? Yeah. Listen. I don't ever desire to be a three-piece suit preacher around right there. If that's what he drives me to, fine. But I'd rather be a John the Baptist. Yeah. I'd rather be a Matthew or a Peter or a Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Paul worked hard. He was an honest, honest hard-working man. Not only did he work hard to persecute the church, but he made tents on the side. <laughs> and then we went making tents and got salvation and began to preach on it, Dennis. Listen, I don't need no pretty office. I'd rather that thing be a bathroom. I don't need a high ceiling even though it's pretty. I just need it covered enough that we can be dry. I don't need nothing. I don't even need that projector. That's why the God blessed us with good red back handles. <coughs> when it comes down to it, I've got a Xerox machine at work. Brother Dean, I can make copies if we need it. I don't have to have these things. I just need the chance. I just need the opportunity. I just need a mountain to stand on the side of like Jesus did. I just need a dry place that they can gather around me. Somebody ought to hear us tonight. I just need a well where I can wait for God to send me somebody. You know what I'm talking about? I want to be like Jesus was, Brother James. I want to be doing what Jesus was doing, Brother Scott. I want to be found about His business. I, I, I want to be glory. You can turn over to Matthew 25. I want to be found doing exactly what Jesus was doing and I want to be showing the love of God not just to the masses, but to the individuals. It ain't a measure of the quantity of my work, Daddy. It's the quality of my work. For every David that led a nation and killed a Goliath, there was a Jesse that raised him from a child. For every Samuel that was raised in the temple, there was an Eli to raise him up. And Eli wasn't all that good, but we'll leave that as it is. For every Joshua, there was a Moses that preceded him. For every Noah, there was a daddy. Do you hear what I'm saying today? For every 12, there was a Jesus. You hear us? Listen, I'd rather be able to change one life and get them to heaven than just scatter it on a bunch and nothing ever come out of it. I'd rather have 20 people willing to work with nothing than 3,000 not willing to work with anything. You say, well, how, how does that work out, Sean? To be honest with you, it works out pretty good in my math. Jesus sat down with something close to 10,000. Now, the Bible says there was 5,000 men not counting women and children. Now, there might have been more women and children because a lot of them men worked. And they wasn't at work. Women and children at that time didn't work all that often. They were often stay-at-home moms, as we could call them. And they had a lot of youngins running around. There might have been more than 10,000 people. There might have been more women and children there than there was men. Now, we don't know. Again, we could, we could fathom on that all night and not be wrong because we ain't got no answers, Robbie. But you know what? There's far more than 5,000, we believe. And you know what he sat down with? He sat down with two loads. Yeah. Or two fish and three, three loaves and two fish? Yeah. Five loaves. Five loaves. There we go. Two fish and five loaves. I get that. Yeah, he fed the 4,000. A lot of people don't know that. That happened twice. But he sat down with the five loaves and the two fish. And he fed 5,000 people. Yes. List minimum. Very minimum. That means I can take this church with no money and a handful of people and we can turn Martin County up on its top. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. And that's what I want to happen. Not for my glory, 
I don't want my name in it, Robbie. I do it for the kingdom of God. Amen. That's right. Jesus didn't want his name in it. Matter of fact, he healed them people and he would tell them, say, listen now, don't be, don't, don't be giving me no glory about just keep your mouth hushed. Just shut up. Go on. Ain't nobody needs to know what God just done there for you. Just it's between you and God. You work this out. I, I don't, because I know what you're going to go do. You're not going to give credit to God. You're going to go give credit to me. And here we're going this roundabout thing again. And I don't want no credit. No. Give it to God. Give the glory to God. <clears throat> yeah, my flesh gets in the way. I'll, I'll confess pride. I, I like being in the center of a room. I can't sit here and deny I don't. But I'd rather die than have my pride destroyed what God would do to me. That's a bold statement. But I'd rather die than have my pride get between me and God. And destroy what He can do for me. And it can happen so easy thing today. Pride. Pride. And the Holy Spirit before destruction. Matthew 25, 35. We're about done. Drive this home. God tells Jesus what to do. Jesus tells us what to do by His example and His words. And this is what He does. And He doesn't just do it to the masses, but He does it to the individuals. He's talking about the judgment here. He's talking about what people should have done, or in this case, has done. And verse 35 reads like this. He says, For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Do you notice what he said there? He didn't say us, and he didn't say them, Tara. He said me, the individual. You came to me. You came to the individual. I think sometimes, Bert, the only thing we care about is a platform to reach more people. I just want to reach the ones that God sends me. Yeah. I just want to reach the ones that God sends me. If you go on down a few verses from that, Brother Scott, he starts talking about the ones who was not doing his work. And he said, I was hungry and you fed me not and I was naked and you clothed me not. I was thirsty and you didn't give me drink. And I was in prison and you didn't come see me. Amen? Yeah. Say, Sean, have you failed? Yeah, I failed. We've all fallen. I'll still fail. I'll still fail. But I want to try. I think about Sister Maynard. Should have been there. A little bit more. Maybe a lot more. But it should have been there. Amen? Amen. Yeah, I failed, Dad. I, I get, I'm so short-sighted. The only thing I can see what's in front of me. I just some days try to live through the day. I just want to get home from work some days. Some days I just want to get to work. Some days I just want to get home from work. Some days I just don't think it's ever going to end. You know what I'm talking about. We get caught up with the humdrum of life. But that don't change the fact that even when I'm working, I'm still called to ministry. Amen? The needs of the people don't change because I'm making tents like Paul. Can you say amen to all that? God's given us a call tonight. God has given us a call to ministry and to worship. We just talked about when Jesus wasn't praying, He was ministering. Can you say amen? amen. And this week, I want you to begin to pray Henry Blackaby said it like this, and, and Brother James has something to say, and Brother Bill is going to take us to Brother Bill Jr. is going to take us to altar call. Find Revelation on the force of Kyle. Brother Henry Blackaby said it like this. He said, when you see God working, that's your invitation to adjust yourself to, to go and join Him. In other words, when I see Denver in need, that's my invitation to go and join Him. When I see a person with a flat tire, that's my invitation, Daddy, to go and join Him. 
Philip, when he seen the Ethiopian eunuch in the chariot, the Lord said, go to him. He seen where the Lord is working, and he joined himself to him. The Lord revealed to Moses that he was going to get his people out of Israel, and he said, I want you to help, and Moses joined himself to him. He didn't need Moses, but he chose Moses, and Moses had the option to say yes or no. But Moses chose to join him. Me and Missy got back to the office praying before church last Sunday. And God spoke humbling words to me, Brother Denver, and he said, I don't need you. <clears throat> what? He don't need me, Dad. He don't need none of us. He don't need none one of us. Need. Need's the key word there. He don't need me. We're talking about a God who hung the stars and, and made us from dust. He doesn't need me. But He wants me. Yeah. And we need Him. Yeah. And He wants me and He chooses me. That's what He told me. He said, I don't need you. But I chose you to speak my word. Okay. I'm going to put you in place now. I'll, I'll cut you down to size real quick, Brother Robin, when the Father says, I don't need you. But I chose you. And you know what? I'm so thankful that he did. The realization that he don't need me, but he loves me that much, Bert, that he still pursues me. Man alive. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. As Brother Bill comes, Brother James, speak your peace, brother. I was just going to say that uh, since I've been back over here, I've been around some of my family. And it's uh, a shock when you think about it because sometimes you may be called to help somebody and never know it. Uh, I met a dear friend of my uncle, a man I've never known, named Ronald. Ronald and Rick commenced to tell me that Ronald had got out of the pen just a few years ago, 25 years served for murder. He murdered a man who shot him. <coughs> well, when Ronald got out of the pen, he went to his family and no one would help him. He went to some of the local churches in the county and no one helped him. In the course of three years, my uncle looked and met him off the street, found him walking around carrying a backpack with one change of clothes and a bag of ginseng he was going to sell to buy food with. My uncle gave him a home that my uncle had him. Took Ronald to the car lot and got him a car. And then when Ronald Dean come up and he couldn't get no income, he went back to Urban to make a living again. Well, until he got his income, my uncle went over to him and gave him a four-wheeler so he'd get out in the mountains and find them herds. And my uncle didn't know this man from Adam and Eve made him on the side of the street and oh. helped him out. Amen. And that's, that's the type of people. My uncle is not a good <coughs> man. He, he mentions that. He said, I know the devil's all over me and Satan, Satan's got me in my trap. But he also admits that he, when he sees somebody he knows he can help <coughs> and he knows he'll do good by, he don't care. Amen. And I've been back over here and he's taking care of me until I get on my feet. Come on. And I've seen people, just like brother that fellow Ron has said in the church house, won't even lift a finger to say you tell you hi. And as the old saying goes, he'll spit on you if he's on fire. Amen. You never know when you're gonna be called to help somebody. It could be the littlest thing. Sean? He's helped me. Sheila's helped me. And it's the <coughs> things that matter. Go ahead, Bill. I'll do that now. I like what Brother James was saying about helping people. 